Well, welcome to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex Community College, and today I'm talking with one of my favorite guests, Victor Trier, who teaches history here at Middlesex Community College, and is also he's been on the show previously because he's written so much, and so he's written uh, both historical works on the Pedro Pan movement. You're working on the Muriel Boatlift, right? That's right. Yes, yeah? that's correct. And you have a series called the Unbroken Circle. Right. That's a fictional series, a historical fiction. Yes. Right. Yes. About about the early uh, struggles against Castro and about the, some of the major events early in the revolution. It's a, it's a family drama. And so it's really driven by the characters, by their situations. But the historical backdrop is everything that occurred in Cuba during that early period between, oh, let's say the time that it was kind of known that Castro was a communist, which of course when he took over, nobody knew that, and the end of 1962 and it's about and it's it's about a family and in, and in that you see the whole anti-castro movement in cuba during 1960 through the bay of pigs invasion right you got a front row seat to the bay of pigs invasion and the invasion of cuba by brigade 2506 and then the aftermath of that and then you also see you also have a front row seat to operation pedro pan and you get to follow these two kids through their experience in the united states and which i tried to make as exciting as possible. And, you know, and, and people have enjoyed it. They really have. It was the first time that I've really written fiction that length. I've I'd written short stories. And so it took me quite a long time, but I finally did it. As a spectator, you know, it always looks like, oh, this would be easy to do. But once you dig into it. Oh, it you know what? It's yeah. always famous last words. Right. This will be easy. And it was anything. But there's also a big learning curve for me to write fiction. I think I did it okay at one point in my life, say at the beginning of graduate school, because I did write a number of short stories. But then I think I got so much into academic writing and so many brain connections were made there that I didn't even realize. And then when I went back to writing fiction many years later, I realized how difficult it was to undo everything that I had learned in graduate school and writing my academic works to go back to writing about people in a fictional context. So it, it took me a while. It took me a while, but I finally did it. And I think I did okay with it. Well, you're, this is part of our Meet the Professors series. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I mean, I think about when I think about you writing the fiction and then also writing history mm -hmm. is that you're looking at it from two, I mean, it's two different perspectives right. on the same events, right? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, one, you're, you're kind of chronicling and officially, academically. And but one thing I always enjoyed with the academic works. My first book was on Operation Pedro Pan, which was kind of an underground railroad bringing Cuban children to the United States when it was at first revealed that Castro was a communist and that all the children were going to have to go to communist schools or they were going to be indoctrinated. There was a big panic. A lot of families left. A lot of families sent their children ahead through this program. But I realized then what I enjoyed the most was talking to people and interviewing people. And I really got a sense, and I don't think that I would have had this sense had I never left Miami because I was born and raised in Miami in the exile community that any Cuban American any Cuban exile you talk to has an incredible story I mean you could literally stop anyone on the street in Miami who came from Cuba and say tell me your story and you'll probably be you know riveted to your seat for the next three hours just and starting with my wife who came in 1980 and her story in fact my first conversation with my wife in 1988 uh, in Gainesville, Florida, we had you know some mutual friends, and we were all somewhere together, and we just started talking. And she told me about her experience coming from Cuba, and I was just, you know, flabbergasted by the story. And then I realized everybody's got stories like that, and and so I really started to pursue more of that. And so what I did with the Bay of Pigs book, what I'm doing with the Mario Boatlift book, is a combination of traditional narrative history, mostly based on secondary sources, you know, bringing the reader up to speed, and then letting the voices of the people I interviewed take over. And so it, it, it makes for a nice combination, I think. But I always liked that human story. I, that, that human story that's so close to me, to my family, because my family also you know, fled Cuba in, in 1960 and 61. Everybody I was brought up with and around had gone through that. that that's what marked my community growing up. But it just seems so normal growing up that it, that one doesn't see how exceptional this is really until one leaves and one starts to share and one starts to speak to other people and then all of a sudden you realize there's real power in those stories so for the fiction i just you know kind of made up a story that was very plausible of what happened to this family and just made them every cuban family of that era right the players in that larger drama That's so we right. have to take a break and when we come back we're going to keep talking about uh, you as a teacher here okay. at Middlesex community college thank you 
Well, we're back, and this is Middlesex Moments Radio Show, and Victor Trier is my guest today, and this is the Meet the Professor show with the series that we have going. So I thought it would be good to ask about the courses that you are teaching in, in your life today, like my life today, okay. uh, and what and and uh, and one of the things that stands out about you, well, first of all, is that your uh, people love taking your courses. Oh. And um, and so that's always good. And I meet people in the community who ask me if I know you, which is just really nice. And they're and they always have a smile on their face. So they're happy to hear that I do know you. Well, that's nice. I'm privileged to know you. Uh, but you don't have any prerequisites on your courses, and that's you know that's a point of contention in higher education because we like everything to be you know linear and lockstep and hierarchical. And of course. So uh, why don't we start with why don't you have any prerequisites for any of your courses? Well, I don't know. I guess there's a lot of reasons. I guess one would be a logistical one. I think it must be very frustrating for a young student to come to college and realize he can't enroll in any courses except for these over here which are all aimed at just skills building. I think the number one thing having been a community college student myself, having gone through this, having you know being a person that wasn't a very good high school student, even though I went to a very good high school. I went to a very good private high school, but I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't excel in high school. And I went to Miami Dade Community College. And I think what happened was that I just got motivated. I found something that I really loved. I think I had always loved history. My parents were very good about traveling, and, and so we traveled a lot. You know, I was, even my grandparents were into history. I was, I was always around. It seemed so natural. And I didn't know it was something you could major in. I remember a couple times having indoor suspension in high school and, <laughs> and, and, and taking my history book with me. It's like, I need something to read. And I sure wasn't going to read my science book or, or my math book. And so I just take my history book and, and read that. And I always enjoyed it. And when I got to college, it, certain, a whole bunch of things happened in my life beyond just academic. But when I realized I can major in history, I mean, that was like telling me I could major in watching the Dolphin game on Sunday. Uh, it was just something fun. And something happened during those two years at Miami Dade that I just got, I became a very motivated learner, a super motivated learner. And I believe that motivation is the number one thing in education and when you get here. You may not have good skills, but if you take a course to build your skills, but you're not being motivated, it's not going to do anything. But if you get into a class and you love the subject matter and you feel motivated to learn, and, and, and it's uh, something you almost have to live through to understand, when you become a motivated learner, you want to learn and you, you get a thrill from learning. And that's only going to happen by taking courses. And maybe that'll happen to you in psychology course, maybe it'll happen to you in, in history and all that. And, and I think that maybe some of those basic skills will come, right? Because you're going to need those in order to, to, to learn further in this. You're going to have to build those skills and you'll be motivated to do it. But I, I think the motivation comes first. And without the motivation, you're not going to get anywhere. And, and, and by motivation, I don't mean I want my degree to go out and make more money, but just to become intellectually motivated, I think is huge. And so I don't want to stop anybody from taking my course. I know that I've been, you know, that not everybody agrees with that. And I understand their reasons. And I realize that at some point you are going to have to develop those skills. There's no question about it. But I think that a lot of students have benefited. And I've had a lot of students tell me, boy, I didn't do well on your test, but I love coming to your class. <laughs> and that's very important long term. I mean, maybe it's not useful from the, you know, if you if you bring the checkoff list mentality. Okay, first take this, then do this, then do this, then do this, and then I get my degree, and then I go here. But, you know, I, I think what we miss is that People don't work that way necessarily, especially a lot of our students who were a lot like I was when I went to community college. And I think, you know, to get them fired up, to get them motivated academically is 90% of the battle. And I think that once we do that, then the learning just comes. I mean, it just starts to happen because, and I've seen it happen here a thousand times. We get some really, really smart students here who may be academically their academic record may not reflect that. But put them in a situation where they become motivated learners and all of a sudden their GPA just just goes up and they start doing extremely well. So I guess it's the motivation thing and, and just let them in and see if we can get them fired up. Sure. <laughs> and light, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I view my, my main job as lighting a fire. 
you know, lighting a fire under them and getting them fired up to learn. And and so that's why, yeah, let them in. Let them in. Let's see if it happens here. So how was class today? Class was great today. Oh, I mean, we're on Rome. And every time, you know, and, and I have my syllabus with my coverage schedule and what I'm going to do each day. And, of course, as it happens every year it's like oh great i only got one more day left to do rome and i'm not even I'm only like a third of the way through it because i and and i keep apologizing to my class i say listen i wasn't going to tell you about this but i am anyway and i'll just go off and i'll start telling them you know part of the story that that really I, maybe i shouldn't include in class because i'm looking at the clock and there's a time factor but i'll tell them anyway because i and and, and you could just tell from the energy that you're receiving you know from them that they want to know. It's like, no, no, don't stop. You know, keep telling us this story, please. And 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 so I do. And so we're now on the whole period of the end of the Roman Republic and the rise of the emperors, which is I, I think is is very relevant to you know today and when what we see today and in, in our politics. Uh, not not that we're being taken over by an emperor, but you know the Roman Republic worked in a certain way that that does have some parallels with our system. Of course, very different at the same time, but but it was uh, uh, um, an inspiration to many leaders like John Adams and others. And it's it's a story of how all that can fall apart, and almost by its own force, almost by the force of history, by the way things had changed, by the new problems that come up, and and what people expect from government, and then could lead to something like what happened in Rome. When Rome lasted another four hundred years. Mind you, so I mean, it isn't like Rome collapsed as a result of it, but it wasn't the same Rome as before, and and I try to emphasize that with the students. And and it's, it sounds like they can relate to it. I mean, I, you're absolutely right about the sort of founding fathers of this country right. having very clear in their minds the history of the oh, sure. ancient Greek and Rome. Absolutely, they loved it. They, they, it was a it was an obsession, certainly with ancient Athens. Yeah, uh, with Republican Rome. And it wasn't just the founding fathers, but it was a lot of the modern thinkers of the Enlightenment uh, who were really pushing this. And and really, it expanded. It's interesting because it expanded from that, from almost an ideological admiration or or you know, wanted to emulate it to a certain degree. But it really spread out to all of antiquity. They just kind of became obsessed with antiquity overall. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you look at some of the architecture, the Washington monuments and an obelisk. And and even if you, you know, and I love showing pictures when I talk about Roman Greece of Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, if you look at, at, at Abraham Lincoln, that was inspired by the statue of, of Zeus at Olympia. Uh, if you look at the front of Lincoln's chair, you'll see Roman fasces right there. Um, I love showing them, you know, pictures of the Supreme Court building and uh, of the Parthenon, of, of the Roman Pantheon and the Jefferson Memorial. And, and I try to emphasize that here we had the opportunity to do it because here you know, that system was able to implant itself without any competition. In Europe, it was a little bit more difficult because you had other traditions there. But just how important that period was to our founding fathers. I mean, it was enormous, and to, to the whole generation of the 18th century. In Europe and, and in, in, in from, you know, from Prussia to, to wherever, to France especially, that whole period became very important. And the architecture reflects that. So what's the arc of your course, the one that you're teaching now? Well, the one I'm talking about now is the Western Civ One, which we start with, you know, Mesopotamia and go all the way through the death of Louis XIV of France. And so we're passing through Rome now. But I, I spend more time on Rome than anything because I feel it's very important. It's where Western civilization first took root in the West, unless you include Greece as being the West, but at least west of the Bosporus Straits. Um, it's almost a culmination of all those cultures from before, plus the Etruscan. It's really where the West begins, in the West. And of course, you know, everything before that is kind of leading up to Rome, and everything after that is post-Rome, which took a very long time to get to anywhere close to where Rome had been. But, you know, certain elements of Rome, you know, survived. You know, the church and Christianity and everything associated with it. And so when they took a, so when they look around them, I try to make them aware of how many things in their world currently, you know, come from ancient Rome, things that they couldn't even imagine, like the names of the calendar. And there's nothing that students like and more than having things from their everyday world, which they don't even think about, explained to them and what the story is 
behind them. Yeah, right. And Julius and Augustus Caesar right. inserted into the calendar. That's right. They, they right. had too few days in the calendar. Yeah. And so they, they took that and, you know, and you have July and August as, as a result. Yeah. And, 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 and I explained to the students, I said, you know, what, what does sept usually mean? So, I mean, seventh and oct, eighth. It doesn't and work. Yeah, right. Like, and and it's like, to, so why yeah. are our ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth months called seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth? And so it's because they jammed these two months in yeah. there and then didn't bother changing the name of, you know, what, what it was before. So, right. so, we, so I mean, I mean, I like stopping and explaining those things and, and things that are, that are part of our world even today, even our legal system. And I asked them, you know, what, you know, if you become a lawyer in the United States or in Mexico or in Argentina or in Germany, you, you need to know a lot of words in which of the three languages. And I'll make up three, I'll make Latin one of them. It's like, well, Latin. It's like, well, why? Because our whole legal system, or, or a large part of our legal system is, is based on it. Um, it took a little while for it to make it back into the West after Rome collapsed, but it's nevertheless there. So it's fun. I have... A tremendous amount of fun teaching not just about Rome but about everything yeah. just like in, in Western Civ 2 what I spend the most time on is World War One um, I spend more time on World War One than anything because that becomes like that watershed event that you know everything led up to and everything eventually followed so we have to take a break sadly and oh, well. when, when and when we will be back for the last segment of the show maybe we'll talk about World War One and all right more contemporary events well, we're back for the final segment of Middlesex Moments Radio Show with Victor Trier and our Meet the Professor. Uh, and and we, over the break, we've been having a very lively conversation. So, But we've got to bring this back to something that I think would be of interest to people who might think about taking one of your courses or some, proposing to somebody else that they ought to take a course. Mm-hmm. I would propose it to everybody. <laughs> uh, which is, do you require a book? Because you're sort of like a talking living yeah, book. Yeah, I do. And, and I tell the students, you know, the book is used as a general guide. I tell them from day one, the lecture is the course, the course is the lecture. And I do try to follow the book chronologically but you know I tell them there's a lot that I bring into the class that it's not in the textbook and I'm not going to leave out something that's very valuable or very interesting that I think you'll benefit from just because it's not in the book but you know, the textbook author is faced with the challenge of trying to condense everything and so I see a textbook or using a textbook as almost permission for me to expand on you know whatever I feel like expanding on and I do. And then there's certain parts of the textbook which, you know, may contain things that I don't think are that important or that I think might bog things down a little bit that I just want to touch on and move on. And so, but I always tell them, you know, buy the book, but you have to show up to class. And the lectures, the course, the course, and that, of course, is in my on-ground classes. And I also make, and, and I know this might, I might get into trouble for this, but I, but I draw a sharp line between the online classes and the on-ground classes. And I tell my on-ground students, this is not an online course, nor is it a hybrid course. It is so important for them to show up. It is so important for them to be there that I do everything in my power for them to be there. Uh, Among those things are, if you want to get the assignment, I copy it on a piece of paper and hand it out to you, right? I'm, I'm, I'm I'm not going to post it because that just is another inducement not to come to class. So, you know, if you want to turn in a take home test or an assignment, don't, don't 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 email it to me. Give me a hard copy of it. Because mostly not because I don't know how to open it and print it. Obviously anybody could do that. But I want them there. I want them there to to be there to to hear the story. And I think you know it it, it works. I mean I can't force them to be there, but I want them to be there because I, I think it's very important in the learning process to be there. And I tell them the first day. I said, listen, when people ask you what it is you're taking on, I don't know, Tuesday, Thursday at 11 o'clock, I don't want you to tell them I'm taking Western Civilization too, and then read from the catalog, a systematic study of the da, 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 da. I say, I want you to tell people, it's story time. I have story time on Tuesday, Thursday at 11. Because I tell them, all I'm going to do is come here and starting, and I was telling this on the first day, starting next class, I'm going to start telling you a story. And it's going to have characters and plots and situations and and, and all of that, and, and every now and then we're going to stop, and I'm going to tell you, just to, you know, tell me about, about that story I've been telling you. Those are called tests. And then we're just going to go all the way up, up, up until the time that we're all running behind our Christmas shopping, okay, to do that. Or if it's the winter and the spring semester, I say, and by the time we get done, we'll all be in shorts again, because uh, it'll be May. And so I just, you know, and, and I try to not make it intimidating for them. I try to make it a story, uh, and as exciting as I could possibly 
make it. And again, I love doing it. And then my online classes, of course, are different. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a logistics guy. I try to, I try to keep the logistics simple. The, the, the course material is complex enough. So I try to keep everything simple. My assignment simple. The tests, not easy tests, but I mean the same types of tests every time. Very clear what is worth what without complicating it. And I try to do the same in, on my online courses. My online courses, I post everything on Sunday night. Everything is due the next Sunday. And it's the same thing week after week. Same pattern, same everything, which I know the students appreciate because there's nothing I think students dislike more is a, a, a course that seems complicated. Not the material, but you know what is due, when is it due, what is it worth, how does this relate to all this other stuff? And you you know you never know what your average is, and so I, I try to always keep that simple. And and I could keep it simple. Not, not every course you can do that, right? But in my courses you can, and so I do. And so and and my online courses I teach the same ones online, except on online I also teach a world history, which I don't do on ground, but I do teach the world history online. And so far that's been you know a, a pretty successful course for us since I've been teaching it. Well, it must be my fourth year or so of teaching that course. So how do you, do you have a sense that I mean, how does a student show you that they've been listening? Do, I mean, when when they're writing, do they are they writing papers and what do you want them to to learn? Well, I, I want them to learn question. everything. Yeah. And 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 sometimes you know when when I look at some of the textbook series, not necessarily the ones that I use, but just what's available out there when it comes to assessments and it's like everyone's always reinventing things uh, because maybe because there's a lot of money to be made by reinventing things in education and always, you know, letting people know what a crisis we're in in education. There's always a new way of doing things and we need to, you know, go out and spend all this money to implement this because, and if you ever want to not convince me that something is true in education, start by telling me all the recent research shows because everybody's got research that could show almost everything. I remember when I was an undergrad, the professor would ask us pretty much everything on the test that we had studied. So I figured if I was in class 80% of the time, I'd get an 80 on the test. But when I went to graduate school, they really tricked me. The professors would give, there'd be a midterm and final. The professor would go in and lecture, 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 for weeks and weeks and weeks. And you'd finally sit down for a test. And they'd ask you maybe 15% of what they had talked about. But you had no clue what 15% they were going to ask you. Maybe if you missed a couple classes, the 15% will come from what you missed. And since it was a moving target, you you had no idea. It could be anything. And so you went to every class and you studied everything and you took great notes on everything because you didn't know what little piece of that of that of, of that picture they were going to ask you. And it was so effective. And then when I when I took my comprehensive exams for my PhD, it was the same way. It's like, okay, you have one exam, you have four exams, you have a six-hour exam in this time period and a four-hour exam in each of these of these three time periods. Good luck, see you next year. And I studied 40 to 60 hours a week for 16 months without any clue what they were going to ask me. And by the time I took the exams and by the time I studied and took the exams, they probably asked me less than 1% of what I studied. I know, I had the I same studied. experience, yeah. But you know what? I studied everything yeah. yeah it didn't even matter what they asked me about because taking the test i didn't learn anything from taking the test i learned everything in preparation for the test and so that becomes the secret how are they preparing for the test what are they doing to prepare for the test that's where they're, they're learning right not so much in taking a test itself but what are they doing to prepare and so i kind of employ i mean of course i asked more than one percent of what i asked but i kind of keep it a moving target as well and, and the students ask me you know, if 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 they ever ask you, you know, do we get a study sheet mm -hmm. for our test? I say, let me see your notebook. Here they go. There's your study sheet. <laughs> the notes you've taken. Are they madly taking notes while you're lecturing? Yes, and what I tell them to do is what I do. Okay, I'm always listening to books on tape in the car. Or I'm reading something, and a lot of times I'll be I'll be listening to a book on tape. Like I was uh, 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 David McCullough, 1776. I was listening to that last year in the car. And, and, and I would get to work every day. And there's all this stuff that I learned from reading that book, as you do when you read any book. And I would go straight to my office and I would just write down everything that I had learned in the past 24 hours from reading that book and incorporate it or part, incorporate bits of it into my lecture. So I tell students to do the same thing. When you're done with class, within the hour, 
or before you sit down for dinner. Everything I've told you is still fresh. So take notes in class in one notebook. But before the day is out, and as soon as you possibly can, go home and rewrite those notes in a second notebook. And of course, you'll understand what you wrote in your notes because your notes are sloppy and you're using abbreviations and all this. You'll still remember what you meant by what you wrote. Plus, you'll still have my voice in your head and make that second notebook what you're going to study from. And there you could, you could spend a lot of time and write it out and be elaborate. You know, don't just write notes and not look at it for six weeks until we have a test. So I'm going to have to close out the program, which oh. is killing me, because uh, what you've just stated is like is exactly how students need to learn and how I learn, and I think how I, sure. how research shows, Victor, right. that that's how <laughs> people learn. But isn't as simple like this is how it works, kind of right. a set of directions. Absolutely. So um, I can't, I can't and, thank and, you and, enough. And, and if you look at you know math teaching, it changes what every year. Yeah. At least if if you follow the press and and you know all this controversy over Common Core or whatever it is, I don't. I don't even understand it completely but I do know parents it's like this is different to you know how I learned it of course it's when I learned it was different to how my parents learned it but 28 divided by 7 is still you know you still get the same answer you still get as the same you did answer. 40 years ago That's however right. you reach it so. right. well thanks for joining me on this what program is today divided by 7 uh, no, 4, four, 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 four. <laughs> it has to be 4 uh, but, so thank you so much for thank you and uh, for those of you in the listening audience who'd like to learn more about uh, Middlesex Community College and its amazing uh, faculty including Victor Trier uh, history professor you can find us on the world wide web at mxcc.edu so check us out and thanks for joining us today Thank you.